You can think the swimsuit competition in the Miss America system is the dumbest thing ever. Totally fine. Let me give you my perspective, because I actually did it. They got rid of it for a few years, and I was ticked. And I did put that post on social media because, look, like, I can pull pigs. I can drive a tractor. I can feel confident in a swimsuit. I can take care of myself, and I can talk about it. And all of those aspects make up who I am. I'm Stephen Fairbanks, a writer and teacher from St. Louis, Missouri, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, I interview Lexi Merrick Beeler. Lexi is a social media consultant. She works with some of agriculture's largest brands, including Pioneer, the seed company. When I invited Lexi in, I thought we were going to talk about, you know, how to run your social media, how to make your Twitter really pop, or your uh, how TikTok works. But we really only talk about that for about 10 minutes. And very quickly, this becomes one of the most interesting interviews I've ever done in this studio. Lexi opens up about her experiences, both as a pageant queen, somebody that has dealt with major anxiety in her life, and we talk about things like the Catholic Church. This interview is wide ranging and really compelling. I found talking with Lexi to be something that was refreshing and exciting because oftentimes people in social media or communications are kind of gray. They don't really wanna say anything, but Lexi was very willing to talk about what she believed in, what she saw, and what she thinks is happening in the future. We're gonna to get to that interview in just a moment, but first, over the holidays, I had a chance to do a whole bunch of legacy interviews. This is where I sit down with someone's loved ones to hear their life stories, to capture all the experiences that they had so that future generations have the opportunity to know their family history. What was interesting about this holiday season was we had some interesting mixtures, one of which was instead of a husband and wife couple, we had two old business partners. One was really nervous about coming in and interviewing and the other couldn't get in the chair fast enough. They sat down and they talked about the way that they started their company, the challenges they faced, some of the problems and successes that they had, and then they really got to talk about what they admired in one another. What this allowed for was a rich tapestry of two people that were both widowers that normally maybe would have had a spouse to sit there and tell them, hey, remember that story, or don't forget this, or you're being too modest about this part. And instead we had these two men sit and be able to describe this so that both of their families would know where their wealth came from, how hard they had to work for it, and what kind of a difference they were able to make with their company. If you're interested in having us sit down with your loved ones or business partners or even something creative that we haven't done before, go to LegacyInterviews.com to find out more. All right, without further ado, let's head to the interview with Lexi Merrick Beeler. Lexi Merrick Beeler, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Van. So nice to be here. You run social media accounts for some of Ag's biggest brands, and the first question that comes to mind is, why would any individual follow a brand on social media? It's a great question. And my answer to that is a brand represents something. And a lot of times for an individual, especially in the agriculture market, I, I'm just going to be very honest, a lot of farmers sell number two corn. What makes them special? Well, there is something that makes them special, but the brand represents that specialty that those farmers bring. So I love being able to work with some of Ag's largest accounts, whether it be for-profit or non-profit, and really we have a unified voice that represents a farmer. So when you're like helping a, a brand yeah. do social media, what are you, are you writing the tweets? Are you putting the photos together? What are you doing? All the above. So my favorite thing is actually seems a little bit less creative, but I love the process. So in my mind, there is a framework to any social media, and it can be the largest accounts to the smallest accounts to a personal account. But there's a framework that we can follow, and my specialty is putting that framework into play. So that's what I bring. If you need things written, you got it. If you need graphics pulled together, I can do that. I'll either work with the designer or I'll do it myself. Uh, same on, on the copywriting. Um, a lot of times I'll do it myself, but if I need to bring in a specialist on a copywriter, I can totally do that. Uh, but really my specialty is following that framework to get good content out. Because it doesn't matter if you have one piece of good content, you need to have multiple pieces of good content. 
What is good content? Good content has a lot of different meanings, okay? Okay. So it delivers a message. It delivers a message that's important, that resonates with people, or it gives a call to action that drives further action, um, either on a sales or just in like awareness or whatever that call to action deliverable needs to be based on the goals of that brand and that company. Of course, really good content, we'd love it to go viral, right? And I've had some TikToks that do go viral on some of the accounts that I've managed. Uh, but actually, the things that are going viral are not what's selling the business. Uh, what's selling the business is that overall consistency. And that's why that framework's important. And what is the, when a brand hires you, yeah. how do they decide, hey, that was a good hire. We're glad we did that. Honestly, meeting deadlines. Meeting deadlines. That's it. Like if, <laughs> if, if you are hired and you don't miss a deadline, a lot of times they like you. <laughs> Um, and I, I think that's part of that framework, right? Like the, as a creative, especially just in this field, uh, social media can be so creative and, and marketing in general. But unless you're me meeting deadlines, it doesn't help anybody. Uh, so there's a balance there. And I think my brain of the creative side, but then also the business side balances that and brings it together perfectly. You know, that actually like running a business for a few years now, like that is actually the very, very core thing I care about the most if I've hired somebody is like, did you do the thing that we agreed at the time you said you were going to? And like we can work on quality yep. and we can work on like that one didn't work. But if you don't deliver something like now we've got a problem. You're done. Yeah. That That is the biggest thing. And if I'm hiring subcontractors, that's a yes or a no. And here's the other thing. You can miss a deadline, but you sure better communicate it. Because there's probably a reason why you're going to miss it. And not every deadline is realistic, right? But if you're not communicating that. I think there is like a, a generational change. And like I've struggled to bring this up with young people because I'm not trying to insult them. But like I find that younger people, one, they like communicating via text. But two, they like I get feedback from people when I'm like, hey, you know, like, could you just let me know that? Hey, could you just? And they're always like, I don't want to interrupt. Oh, I don't want to send too much. Is this like a cultural thing? Like what is going on there? Because it it drives me nuts. Yes. I think uh, Gen Z specifically. So that would be the generation. I'm on the cusp. I am a millennial, but I'm like right on. There is a generational shift on our younger generation that um, communication is lacking. And um confidence, like they don't want to be in trouble. They don't want to do something wrong. So rather than doing anything, it's easier to do nothing. The, you're spot on on this. Like I have had, I had a guy that, that uh, used to work for me. He was great. If I came in to give him like notes or feedback, his face would get really red. Yeah. He would get really timid. And then even though it wasn't even like, it wasn't, it wasn't like you're bad. It was like, let's improve this he was genuinely worried that I was like mad at him. And I was like, you never, ha I'm never going to yell at you. I'm never going to be like angry with you. We're just going to solve problems. But that is definitely not his, it wasn't his perception. No, and I love working with young women. That's part of my goal as a business owner is I want to lift specifically young women up because I was there at one point in time. And my biggest, like we talk about quality, we talk about deadlines. My biggest work with the young women I hire is simply confidence. Simply just saying, you're okay. <laughs> you have permission to do this, this, and this. And I do think it's a generational shift. And I think we can get there by being aware of it and by the managers being aware of it. Uh, but sometimes managers, I mean, it's it gets frustrating because I don't relate. I yeah, don't understand. The, my two biggest mentors in my life that like helped me business wise was a guy named Court and then this much older man named Pete. And the thing that was the most valuable to me was that they were incredibly direct. So I went from being the middle child, like peacemaker, I can say things so that nobody's upset about it to learning like, oh, but people don't really know what I want. They don't really know how to meet my expectations. And so when these people taught me this, I started implementing it. And I have found that it does not translate with everybody in this generation. And like, I found that like, I'm having to change when I really feel like they should have to change. Yep, yep. <laughs> and recently I had a coworker mention it's resiliency and it might be a little resiliency. Like that was an interesting word I want to dive into a little bit deeper of like, you got to be a little bit tougher. You got to be a little bit more resilient. 
Um, but I do think it's not always on that next generation, too. It, it's going to take a different type of leader. Well, I'm the only one that can change when I want something right? different, right? I can ask you to change, but like particularly around that intimidation factor, like I've had to be like, I think that I'm not that direct. And then I talk with people like my guy, Sean, that, that I, do a lot of work <laughs> with. he's like, you're one of the most direct people I've ever met. And it took me a while to get used to it. I don't know. Am, am, is Yeah, I, I don't exactly know how to handle it, but it's one of those like friction points when you're working with people in a different generation. It's tough. It's it's definitely interesting. So young women, you've hired them for, for doing work for you? Yep. Yep, absolutely. So part of my passion and really my my career, right, has been advocating for young women specifically in agriculture. Excuse me, not just young women, but women in agriculture. I think that's an important part of the culture of agriculture. I grew up on a farm. I am specifically focused on the agriculture industry. And I think it's important to be aware of all the different facets that make up agriculture. So when I started my own business, not only did I want to keep that as a part of my values for my myself. Um, but in the creative business, it's mostly women. <laughs> so it's not like I had a, a big pool uh, to choose. So I'm not choosing on gender, but I do um, love the women that are working for me in all different aspects. So whether it be my personal business on a subcontractor base or through other teams that I join, and there's women on those teams already. But um, I would say I surround myself with a lot of rock star women. And when you're working in social media, do you like working in social media? Is it like, is this, uh, is it a medium that you're like, I'm really glad I'm here? Or you're just like, hey, this is the medium that needs my help. Honestly, no. It's, to me, it is, um, I wouldn't say my passion is social media. Social media is the tool that helps me communicate my passion. My passion is relationships, telling stories, and connecting others. Social media is that tool. And, and businesses need that. So I've been able to create a business around that. And so uh, did you start off with your own business? No, sir. It's new. New in, the, in 2023, it's new. Um, so I've always... Um, I say I started in my my area of business in the eighth grade when I begged my parents to get me a smartphone. And we had dial-up internet, right? Like, it's not like we had, like, a computer that actually works. So getting a smartphone was way crazy. And you were living on a hog farm? Yeah, so we have a diversified livestock and crop farm. So actually more cattle than pigs. Okay. And the pigs were specifically show pigs. We, in the 90s, uh, the pork industry changed quite a bit. Uh, the pork industry really crashed. And my family got out of raising commercial hogs and niched down to specifically show pigs. And that's that was my background. And that's how I got involved in the agriculture industry. And so you're living out in the country and you're begging for a smartphone and they gave in? Um, yes. And I don't know how. I think I just begged enough. Uh, we were at the Iowa State Fair at the U.S. Cellular booth. And I think my mom was like, I don't even care. I'm tired of hearing you talk about it. Um, but from there... I started managing and creating social media accounts for our farm and for our show pigs. And this comes from, um, my mom is tech savvy. She wasn't at the time. Um, my dad is like an 80-year-old cowboy in a 50-year-old's body, so like 40 back then. No email, no social, a flip phone, right? Like we just got him to switch to iPhone a few years ago. So that became my job. And then that started my big career into social media. So when I walked into internships and a brand or a company was looking for a social media manager, well, yeah, I got tons of experience. I'm selling thousands of animals, thousands of dollars of animals, not thousands of animals online already. How oh, and I you were you? actually, it was working. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We had an awesome little business. Like um, we had a boar stud, which sells genetics across the country. And um, we sold a lot of show pigs. We won a lot of shows across the country. And I was managing all of that because my dad didn't know how to do it. Uh, we were selling livestock online. Um, actually, since we've moved out of the house, it's kind of ironic because now one of my clients is showpig.com, which sells, um, that's the place you want to sell show pigs online. It's like eBay for show pigs. For show pigs, yeah. And I used it 10 years ago. But when I moved out of the house, um, my dad stopped doing it because he didn't know how to take pictures, edit pictures, and put them online. 
What are show pigs? Think of Charlotte's Web. You're exhibiting a pig. Simply, that's that's the process. It's it's a little bit elevated compared to what you see in Charlotte's Web, but it is an exhibition, uh, usually a youth show, that they are exhibiting animals to a judge to win a prize. Yeah, and the show industry in ag is like a fascinating thing because I've had a chance to go to some stuff. And like when you're talking about commodity beef or commodity hogs, like that's one thing. And then you get into the realm of like, what do they win on is not the same thing that maybe they would sell on. What is it that show pigs, like how does somebody decide that's a that's a winning show pig? Yep, so I'm also a history nut, right? So it used to be hand in hand. So the shows would be the best, people would get together. They would decide on what the best market animal was. You would learn that at the show and then you would go home and raise that animal for commodity prices. So they were hand in hand. As the industry continued to grow, show pigs became its separate entity entity, and commercial became another. There are still qualities that are important. Muscle, 100% important. Uh, Back fat, just fat overall, like in in marbling in cattle, uh, fat in pigs, like that stuff matters to a commercial producer and to a show pig producer. Where it became different is show pigs we're able to elevate to a level that are fun. So it's size of the legs. We call that bone. Structure. Getting around. Structure is still important to a commercial producer because their pigs have to be able to walk. Their cattle need to be able to walk. Show pigs, it's important because that's how they're judged in the ring. They have to be able to walk. If you're not walking, you're not winning. Um, but the size of their feet doesn't matter to a commercial producer. It's just fun for a show pig producer. Oh, it's in, that's interesting. So there are qualities that you could like amp up in the show pig oh, yeah. side that you would, there'd be no commercial value for it. No need. So does the show pig realm change faster than the commodity? I would realm? say yes. I think that's fair to say. Um, also because they're doing a lot of selective breeding on specific traits and a uh, commercial producers are doing it more on a larger scale. Um, So the amount of pigs, show pigs versus commercial pigs does not compare. Where I'm passionate and where I see it as a really big benefit to the industry as a whole is the show world is a great way to teach young people how to care for animals, how to work hard, and how to compete. And that those are tactics that are going to lead them into their career, whether it be in or outside of the agriculture industry. But the commercial world needs to know how to care for livestock, how to work hard, um, and how to ultimately compete. At the end of the day, competition, I think, is always a good thing. Um, so we're really funneling our youth into an awesome career. Were you a competitive pig shower? Oh, yeah. I was terrible at sports. Terrible athlete. So that was my sport. Ah. Yep. And, like, how well did you do? Like, well. Like, I've won multiple national shows. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And put me through college. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So uh, my, oh, and my family raised all the pigs that we showed too, which is really, I think, special and really unique um, that I had the opportunity to do that. So from my two big shows that I won that I really wanted to win were the National Western Livestock Show in Denver, Colorado, and the Iowa State Fair. Uh, both of those animals, I have a picture of the State Fair winner. His name was Philip. the day he was born. My dad's holding It's on my phone. My dad is holding him up. And the Denver pig, um, we also have a picture of him at a young age because we just knew they were going to be special. You knew from when they were born. You could look at him and be like, that's a real winner? Yeah. I, I'm not going to take credit for that. My dad knew. What did he know by looking at a piglet? Um. Again, structure, composition, body composition, um, size of feet, um, just and right like we can guess a lot of them are going to be good and they won't turn out good. Uh-huh. So it's not there like a some, for yeah, sure yeah. thing. There have been yeah. some false positives on that. Absolutely, and then everything has to align accordingly. So like the judge has to like it. You might think you have a rock star and it just doesn't fit for the judge that day. Um, but those are my two proudest moments and the fact that like we physically got to raise it. Also, it could die. Like, let's be honest, it's an animal. Um, So all the cards were right, and they just all led up to the perfect, perfect situation. I mean, Iowa State Fair, that seems like that's like the Olympics for pigs. It was pretty amazing. It was my very last year. Um, I had never won it. I had been third overall. I had 
like have plaques galore from the Iowa State Fair, right? But I could never get to that very top spot. Um, and it was my very last show ever. So you age out. Um, these are for youth shows. Um, so a lot of these shows across the country are just for youth. So either 18 or under and 21 and under. Okay. Um, because the show industry greatly values the the values that they're teaching. And then you go on and um, have a career. So actually there was a TV show there. So it was captured through Farm Her RFD TV. Um, I told them they could not come because I was really emotional. I had been showing there since I was five years old. Um, the first time I stepped foot at the Iowa State Fair, I won the show at five years old. Um, I won $1,000. And then my last year at 21 years old, I won the show. And I broke my sister's record from the year before and sold that pig for $53,000. $53,000? Yeah. Why does a pig get purchased for $53,000? It was purchased uh, by a supportive business system that was able to come together uh, through the sale of champions, which is also a client of mine right now, um, which is really cool to have that come full circle. But Because this is a business or a group of people that say, hey, we're going to buy these pigs yep. as a as to provide a winning jackpot so then they can do something with that? Yeah, it goes to the kids. And wow. then 25% of those dollars go into scholarship funds. So that year, I sold my pig. Actually, I think it was $53,500. My sister's was 53000 something like that. She was in the sale champions the year before. I broke her record. I got three sisters. Forgot to mention that. So I broke her record. I won that year. And then my sister, Macy, who is like total competitive rock star, biz, uh, like collegiate, everything. Um, she never made the sale champion. She also was close and we could never get her to that spot, but she got a $10,000 scholarship that year. Um, so literally like my parents being a farm family of four kids, like we didn't have a college fund walking into college, but what they did was they gave us opportunities to get us through college. Um, so that money went to our college funds. You know, the thing that strikes me is you were in high school, you're creating this social media account for boars, like, yeah. but you're like talking about pretty adult topics. You're talking about like semen and genetics and, you know, can you the, said that word, not me. That's it. That usually makes people cringe. But yeah, yes. I mean, I know exactly. <laughs> what you're, but, but if you don't tell it, people oh, yeah. be like, oh, she's sharing boar genetics. But like, you really got to think about like, oh, no, like you're we're collecting sharing, like, semen and then to know it. how to impregnate that yeah. pig. Yeah. And, to, like, and then you can do that. Yeah. So like those are pretty adult subjects for a yes. young person. Yes. And I think um, I give my parents all the credit in the world because I also say like on our farm, there wasn't boy chores and girl chores. There was just chores and there was just a lot of poop to scoop. I mean, but like from a young age, we were um, helping sow sparrow, which physically means putting on a glove and getting those pigs out. We were um, hands-on on the farm. And then my parents also gave- Wait, for people that don't know, you're yeah. saying- there's a mama pig. We're we're reaching into her and we are pulling those pigs, uh, piglets, all the way up. Correct. Okay. Like we don't like to do that, um, but when a sow has ten plus babies, they get tired. Yeah. <laughs> um. So we really will give them a hand at that point. Yep. And if they're backwards, um, and they need to come out fast because that umbilical cord breaks and then the lack of oxygen. And so you're doing this, you're doing uh, artific artificial in insemination. Yeah. yeah. And I don't like doing that part. Usually my dad would do that part, but we could. I know a shocking amount about this because <laughs> the people that do legacy interviews, a lot of them have like talked, you know, these stories yeah. where dad wasn't home and the sow needs to be impregnated. Yeah. So mom's out there trying to like... Get like the, sit on the yeah, saddle, yeah, like yeah. see what's in heat. It's, yeah. it's funny because this is such a core part of some people's lives. Yeah. And then there are people right now listening to this that are like, you reach into the pig. Like, how do you get that boar so, ready to give the semen? Like, how does that work? My favorite sweatshirt to wear in the city. So I lived in Des Moines right after college and loved the city of Des Moines, like in the city. Now my husband and I live here in St. Louis and we live in the city. I have a shirt that says... um boars on it and it's just another brand right like I love the sweatshirt I love wearing it especially to the gym because I just giggle to myself I'm like how many people actually realize what's on my sweatshirt right now <laughs> <laughs> like it's so stupid but yeah like it was very normal to be told like hey go get um the alias semen that's at the boar stud and then you would literally drive over to the boar stud get the thing of semen, <laughs> take it back to the farm. 
That was normal. And that you would know that that was even going on. Like, yeah. I was a relatively naive kid. We didn't have the internet in the same way, so I didn't get my education through that. Like, there's no chance in eighth grade I could have told you, like, I mean, I could have, like, told you, like, kind of in general what was going on here, but definitely not in detail and putting it into photographs and trying to sell people. on. I mean, that's, oh, like, yeah. hands yeah. are dirty. Oh, yeah. And um, at 11 years old, I – so all of these livestock shows, right, have – like contests, speech contests, uh, knowledge tests, skillathons, all these competitions. And my family is very competitive. I'm very competitive. So like I wanted to win it all. So in the show ring, all all the things, right? I took this test when I was 11 years old and it was really hard and I was terrible at it. Now I might I like just turned 11 like 3 weeks before, right? Like a 10-year-old child. And my I didn't get in trouble much like my parents I think parented so well, but I distinctly remember being in trouble because I did not answer what does AI stand for correctly. It's artificial insemination. So now we talk about AI. I'm like, why are people talking about artificial insemination (laughs) all the time? Yeah, different mindset. Yeah. You know, I remember uh, the first time I ever, I think like knew who you were. I like you're like, so for people that are not in ag social media, like, it's a small enough world that, like, you know the people that are around there. You kind of – but I remember one time I was flipping through social media and you put a post out there of you in a swimsuit. And it was, it was like, you being like, hey – some you can correct me on this, but it was something to the effect of they're trying to remove the swimsuit competition from pageantry. Yeah. And this is a mistake because – women, like it, the pressure of this is something that you learn to overcome, not something you avoid or something to this effect. Yep. And I was like, oh man, let's see where this goes. First of all, what was the tweet and how, <laughs> how did people reply to it? Yeah. So I love that we go from AI into social or er, to swimsuit competition because this is my life. Uh, so I also grew up, remember all those competitions. Then I became um, the Washington County Port Queen the um, Washington County Fair Queen was first runner up at the Iowa State Fair Queen contest. And then I met someone who said, hey, you should compete in Miss America organization. And I said, bring it on. Love it. I also danced uh, my whole entire life. So that was I said I wasn't athletic. I was um, I had some rhythm, I guess. <laughs> you were a so, girly girl then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. And I think that's like a super cool aspect to how I grew up as well. And again, my parents very much supported that. Like if we wanted to quit dance, the answer was no. (laughs) Um, Or, you know, you could, but like you had to do something else off of the farm as well. Um, So I got into the Miss America organization and it was one of the best things I could have ever done. And it opened my mind and I still use it to this day on whether I'm working on my blog, my business, or um, any aspects of agriculture in general. And I loved it. And the swimsuit competition was the best thing that could have happened to me because, yes, I danced, but I did not work out because I never learned to because I didn't play sports. And uh, it was extremely important to my confidence. I had never seen myself as a girly girl. I had never seen myself as someone who could do something that wasn't second nature because I had done certain things from a very, very young age. Um, So... The fitness competition is back at the Miss America organization. I'm still involved in that organization. I help uh, prep some local contest winners to go to state competitions. I competed at Miss Iowa for two years. Um, The girl that I competed with actually won Miss Iowa, so I have been to the Miss America competition. I did not compete in it, um, but I've been there, and I just think it is such an amazing aspect that brought so many different perspectives to my life that I would have never had, including walking on stage in a swimsuit. They got rid of it for a few years and I was ticked. And I did put that post on social media because look, like I can pull pigs. I can drive a tractor. I can feel confident in a swimsuit. I can take care of myself and I can talk about it. And all of those aspects make up who I am. And I think it's really important for young women to have all those different aspects. I don't even recall. How was that comment received? How was your post? Honestly, I way better than I would have thought. And I think that is the reason why the swimsuit competition is back. And I I understand with body positivity, like not everybody maybe wants to be in a swimsuit. 
Um, but actually, most women who build the confidence and work hard to get there, no matter what size they are, didn't hate the competition. Um, in fact, that was a lot of the favorite parts of the entire Miss America organization competition layout um, was that swimsuit competition. So to me, it felt like because, because not all bodies are swimsuit ready, we don't want to have anybody swimsuit ready. And from my aspect, by having that swimsuit competition, it does prove that all bodies are swimsuit ready. <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. And and it teaches you, I mean, the year they took it out, my sister actually competed at Miss Iowa. She was second runner up. She said those girls were eating Oreos the night before the competition. I don't care if you're in a swimsuit or not. That's not healthy. Uh, so it did make me look at what I was eating. And guess what? I was eating way too much sugar. I wasn't working out. So all those things it taught me to do to take care of myself um, might have been like from an outside perspective, what I needed to do to look good in a swimsuit, but actually it helped me internally more than anything. I think it's really striking that, I, I mean, like I can't remember any Twitter posts or anything like that from years ago, but to be able to write that down in this particular culture, like that was like actually doing something like or saying something that mattered because it's very easy to be like, ah, I kind of, it was good for me, but I don't want to get involved in that. And I remember being like, that's, that's cool. That's like, it follows my, my belief. Uh, we've talked about this before. So for listeners that don't know this, Lexi and I meet like regularly cause she's incredibly creative. And I find that like, if we sit down for an hour, I'll get done and like have new ideas for talks and new ideas for all kinds of things. But I, re you and I have talked about this thing called the Peter Thiel paradox, where it's like, what is the thing that you believe that almost everyone, you know, disagrees with you on? And when you have one of those, then you're actually saying something valuable. You're not just parroting what other people. And that right there was like, hey, this is a person willing to throw out a Peter Thiel paradox. Absolutely. And I also appreciate our time that we spend together because I think about that a lot. And as I got busier and maybe bogged down in like corporate mindset or like trying to fit in and build my life, I realized that I had lost my sense of spark that I had when I was 22 years old, that at, you know, almost 30 years old, I'm trying to get back. Um, and you bringing that post up, it reminds me like, oh yeah, I have this spark in me. And you're not the only one that remembers that post. And to me, it was very personal, right? Like it wasn't like I was trying to break the internet. It was just like, hey, I'm ticked and this isn't okay. And I don't care who's gonna listen, but it was important for me to share that. Yeah, and I think when you, as you get older, you find out like when you're young, having controversial positions can like put you in like, a, oh, they're kind of edgy, they're kind of fun. But as you get older, an edgier and edgier position starts meaning like, hey, I'm going to pay a price for this. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to either it's socially people are going to outcast me, uh, my business may suffer, there may be people that don't like what I have to say. And what you end up getting is people pretending as though they're saying things they believe, but the reality is they're saying things and in the back of their mind and with their friends and with their family, they're saying something different and like it, it distorts things. So having a, the ability to be able to articulate a, a paradox like that is very valuable. And being able to talk through it, like we don't have to agree. You can think the swimsuit competition in the Miss America system is the dumbest thing ever. Totally fine. Let me give you my perspective. Because I actually did it. Well, I have uh, probably a controversial position that I think that, and you, I don't know where you're going to be on this. this okay, might I'm pumped. I uh, feel like there's been a bunch of stuff about mental health with agriculture. And I believe that it is very easy for grifters to come in and be like, we're going to raise money to help people in farming out that are harming themselves. And I don't think they're helping. I agree. Whoa. All right. So this isn't a Peter Thiel paradox. No. Okay. Um, I don't know what the answer is, though. So that's where I'm kind of stuck on that. But I do think mental health is a concern. And I don't think raising money for it is going to do a dang thing. Um, it seems almost cynical yes. when brands do it. Yes. When they're like, we've donated money to a, a fund to help farmers, not, uh, to help our customers not 
kill themselves or right. something, right? Like there's something deeply cynical about it. It's I can understand a brand wanting to do something that's helpful and be associated with doing something yeah. that's helpful, but there's something kind of dark about donating to suicide funds or things like that. It's like they're trying to be reactive rather than proactive. Okay. And I'm a really, I really believe in proactiveness, not reactiveness. Now I appreciate those who are actually doing something like there are some amazing nonprofits that I think are amazing. Um, and I know they've probably done a lot of good, but as for like brands and companies to getting involved, maybe we should try to solve the problem versus being proactive. Oh, excuse me, I can't even say the word, being reactive to the problem. Yeah, I one time heard a veterinarian come in and talk about, to, to a group of farmers being like, hey, I know what it's like to watch these cows die and know that the treatment that you're going to have to do is going to make your farm bankrupt and, you know, all these things. That seemed to me to be like a very helpful thing for somebody to come in and be like, this is what is really happening. I have seen this. This is what we went through. I, I, and maybe that's yeah. what these organizations are doing, but I, there's something really dark about that. Okay, so let's get into like nitty grittiness, right? And I don't even think you knew like opening up this world because I haven't talked about this, which is hilarious because I just go on and say, maybe it's a little hypocritical. I don't know. Maybe it's just that I need to get my spark back and work on it. But um, I have struggled with anxiety big time. Turns out like... I was diagnosed with asthma in like high school. It wasn't flipping asthma. It was anxiety. No and kidding? Yes. Wow. I had an anxiety attack in the doctor's office and she came in and said, I'll give you an inhaler. Okay. Yeah. That's going to help a lot, ma'am. Thank you. But it wasn't like, it's not her fault, I guess, but it technically was because she was the doctor. Um, but turns out I didn't get diagnosed or treated for it until I was planning a wedding and getting ready to move. And it was actually my sweet husband that was like, are you okay? I'm like, no, I'm not okay. Like what is going on? And I will credit the Miss America organization. I have to do yoga. That was one of my things like I have to do in order to get my anxiety under control. And I wouldn't have figured that out if it wasn't for me taking on a workout routine while I competed in Miss America. Wow. The other thing is, is I take a daily medication. Oh, very interesting. And I am very apt to tell personally that I take that. And it has been the best thing I've ever done in my life. And I'll joke like with people who are like, oh, I'm struggling with anxiety. I'm like, God and, and big pharma is not a bad thing. So can I ask what, yeah. what medication you take? Yeah, I'm on a uh, Lexapro. So okay. it, it's generic, but yeah. So that's my daily. And how, how does it work? Do you know like what it does to make you feel better? Or no. Feel not, no. <laughs> it just works. Yes. Now the great thing is, is I did find a doctor that explained it all to me. I still have his notes. And actually, if I ever like second guess or think through it, um, I will go back and look at him. Um, so it Lexapro is for anxiety and depression. I wasn't sure showing signs of depression at all. Um, but it was the lowest dose that I could start on. And I was scared to death, Vance. Like I was against it for years because I, I didn't need it. I, I didn't need it, right? Like I'm not that bad. Yeah, I needed it. And what did it change when you got on it? My moods are here. And every time I got on the plane, I swore it was gonna crash. And I don't think that anymore which is the nicest thing to think of. Yeah. So rather than like giant roller coaster and mood swings of like literal like bad thoughts, I'm a worrier. I'm still a worrier. Like I can I can come up with all the worries in the world. Um, I think honestly, like had I not been on it, I look at starting my business and I think it would have been a lot harder for me to j take the jump. Um, and I just think it's been it's been the best thing. I don't. Like planning a wedding and moving at the same exact time were super stressful and it just made it a lot more enjoyable and it made me take a deep breath and not think about all the bad things that were going to go wrong. And when you start on a medication like this, does it start with the goal of I'm going to get on it to level me out and then get off of it or does it not matter? Great question. So how it works and I should probably, okay, when you say how it works, it, um, you don't want to go off and on. Because that can cause irregular irregularities in your 
brain and and the chemicals that make up your brain. And um, it can actually make you like physically sick and not feel good. So the goal is eventually is you could get off of it, um, but they want you to stay on for at least six months. And now every year I go back once a year. And if it's not harming, then um, I'm just going to stay on it because I've just felt a big difference. And your family and your husband that knew you before and after, yeah. what what has been what have they reflected back to you? I'll tell my husband like it's the best thing I've ever done and he's like I can't tell a difference. Oh really? No, he has no clue. Wow. And he knew me way bef- way well before. I mean, we were a month from getting married. Um but then like, yeah, he he has no clue. And I'm like, "Are you serious? I can tell a difference." My yeah. friends can't tell a difference. I don't have any scope for like what sort of change does that do, right? Because so, in my mind, this is as powerful as like smoking a joint or something. And I think about myself being like if I were high or, or like yeah. that the inebriated all day, that I would be a literal different person. Yeah. Right? Like the person that they're interacting with would be different yep. than the person I was before. Is it not that? And that was a big worry of mine is because I didn't want to be a different person. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I loved the way my brain worked and the way I thought. And literally like my doctor described it. I think there's a piece of paper written like on that piece of paper. Like here are your highs and lows. Like if you can get like in a rut where you don't want to do anything, then that's not helping you. <laughs> and if you can be like so upset because you're so worried about everything that can go wrong, that's not helping you. So really where your brain levels out is it just keeps it a little bit more consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, like I can still get in bad ruts. I can still get really super creative highs. Like it, it didn't impact at all. It just makes me a little more level. I feel like, and a little, like I'm able to actually, you know, when we talk about like reactive emotional, like when you're mad, like I'm not going to attack as much as I wanted to, because I can actually step back and evaluate the situation versus like, I would take everything personally. I would overthink everything. It was just like, not a good anxiety situation. I was also eating too much sugar. I was coming out of college where I probably drank a little too much to be a healthy, normal human. Um, So yeah, it just like really helped level it all out. But I've never posted that on social media. Well, I mean, I think that it's really important because I get into my own like world on how I feel about this. And I have this feeling that one day we will look back on medical birth control and we will say, get me started on that one. We were literally changing the minds of women and we're doing it to such an extent that even something as simple as what they smell is different and that smell and sexual attraction and all of these things are important. And so I look at like, if I have this feeling on birth control, then like the, the, something like Lexapro is even more scary to me. Okay. So what I think is probably a challenge is rather than solving the root cause, we just prescribe more and more on top of it. I was on birth control. Did it change your the way you saw the world? Oh, yeah. It's, it made me freaking crazy. Really? Oh, my acne. It gave me such bad acne. Um, And I think that those mood swings were worse. My cramps were worse. My mood swings were worse. So rather than taking off birth control, what did I have to get? I had to get Lexapro. Oh. To balance that out. Whoa. Right? Yeah. Clearly, I'm not on birth control anymore because I'm pregnant. But I can handle being pregnant at this point in my life. So when I went into my doctor and I had been asking for a while, like, is it okay if I'm still on Lexapro being pregnant? And the answer is yes. I've had a knock on wood. I've had a lovely pregnancy. Like there's not been, you know, we were watching New Girl last night and like they were making fun of Cece being like crazy pregnant woman. I I haven't been, (laughs) which has been wonderful, right? Like, um. And I think part of that reason is because I am able to control my emotions a little bit better because with pregnancy, everything gets heightened. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I'm like Yeah, and perfect. that's the crazy thing about birth control, right? You're telling your body, hey, you're low-grade pregnant. Like you're Literally. you're in like day two or three of pregnancy, right? Yes. I think something like that. And you're on – I started birth control for my acne at age 16. I wow. was on it for 10 years. Wow. 
That's not okay. Yeah. Um, so I would like to get off Lexapro at some point in time, but at this point in my life, it was more important for me to be mentally consistent and keep my body at a consistent pace that was working for me versus having a child and growing a child and then changing everything on top of that. I also don't know this for postpartum depression, but I have done a lot of research that actually the Lexapro that I'm on should help with postpartum depression. And I know that's a very serious concern for a lot of women after they oh, because that is legit. You, that, that postpartum depression, that is something that they should be telling men about a lot more because you have a woman that just like her hormones are flying around. Crazy. And like the thoughts going on in her mind, I mean, how much can you control your own thoughts? Very little. Yeah. But you're now throwing in waves of that. Like women talk about, I thought I would hurt my own child. I couldn't, right. I couldn't, you know, drive into town anymore. I became agoraphobic. Like is a high price to pay to go through the hormone swing of having a child. Absolutely. And then you look at it like women that don't have supportive spouses or family around or going like trying this alone. Like my husband is able to take a lot of time off of work, but um, he's actually not going to be able to because of his demanding job. So I'm like, we're not touching anything, right? Like we're just going to be in coast mode. Um, So that's why I'm still on it to be very honest with you. And part of the reason why I haven't put it out into the world, like a typical thought process that I would, is because I would rather have a one-on-one conversation versus I don't need sympathy. And a lot of times when you post something on social, especially about mental health or especially about anything like Oh, I know. Because the opposite, when you say something yeah. Negative about birth control or yes. SSRIs. People come out of the woodwork to be like, it's like they're like offended. Like, you want me to be dead? Like I'd be dead without yeah. this. Like so, this is a very good conversation yeah. for me because uh, anytime I've put this out in social media, the conversation has not been. Productive. It's not positive, yeah. and that's really why I haven't put it out there because I'd rather have a conversation about it. Um, and again, it's the same thing about like pageants and agriculture and now mental health, like. I'd rather you just know my personal opinion because I don't know everyone's opinion. And I, I'd like, we're able to have a better conversation about it. Yeah. And I think that that's something that people like you absolutely need to hear what other people went through so that when you're going through it, yeah. you're like, oh, okay. Like Christmas time is great. If only because if you go to like a community Christmas gathering, you now see the other people that you view as like professionals that are sharp and well put together and they're worn down and their kid is like laying on the ground screaming and you're like, oh, like (laughs) your life is difficult too. Like you, you like don't, you know, because when you just see people from afar, you don't get to know like what kind of challenge. I think even talking with my siblings over Christmas about like, you know, they couldn't get their kids to go to sleep and they had to sit outside and hold the door because the kid was coming out. And you're like, oh, I thought I was the only one that thought I might have to lock my child in her room. Like, yeah, thank goodness for talking to people. But if you spend too much time on social media and that's the only interaction you have, your views on things, I think one, um, can't be clarified by other people. And two, I myself become more extreme in yes. my views. And when you asked me earlier if I like social media, I and I said it wasn't my passion. It's simply because I see it as a tool, right? I still think social media is not replacing human conversation. And it's really important to have human conversation. And that's there's some things that don't need to go on social media because I don't know how to get it across correctly. And that's okay. It's funny you said that about the human communication because I realized that as I started doing more legacy interviews – I use Twitter way less. And I think it was because like I was living in a world where a lot of the communication I did. Now I've had all these great conversations. I've heard all these stories. And you're good. And so like the number of times I post on Twitter is way, way down. I actually walking in here was just thinking that. I don't even think I'm logged out, like X logged me out of Twitter. And I don't think I've posted a tweet in over a year. Oh. And I was on that's probably how we met was Twitter. Yeah. Um I think so. I just don't use it anymore. I don't need to. I'll get on. I'll scroll. Um, but yeah, my my usage, specifically on Twitter, has gone down a lot. 
So you mentioned earlier that a lot of the people that are in social media are women. Yeah. Why do you think women are drawn to this particular field more than men? I... That's a good question. In communications in general, it's a, it's a female-dominated field. And I think it's an opportunity. I do think, like, I said I advocate for women on that's just part of my values. Um, but that doesn't mean always equal. And that doesn't mean that we can't look for the qualities that each each gender brings because they do bring different qualities. And I think that's amazing. So actually, um, I just gave a speech a few weeks ago that was about imposter syndrome, but rather than women, like we've talked about the confidence and, and having imposter syndrome, rather than letting that take over them, um, using it as a gift to bring a different perspective to the table, uh, specifically in the world of agriculture and females can do that. And I think females in general have been drawn to the communications world because um, in my mind, I see more females being having that creative mindset I think um, there are certain skills that females' brains are naturally able to take on, and it just has naturally gone into the world of social media and communication. Yeah, my wife is an engineer, and I'm the communications person, so I think in a lot of ways, like, I went to find the opposite, right, yeah. because I was, like, the just highly, like, blah, blah, blah talking, yeah. and have lived in the world of, of communications, and it is a lot of women. Yeah. And uh, uh, I have a hypothesis yes. that I believe that um, the women that are in it, another way to say this is I believe that um, college party girls actually rule the Western world, and that the way that this has all occurred is that the person that is in communications, oftentimes a partier, right? Like I was in communications, I was in college, right? So these are often like people that they both get their central satisfaction from being an extrovert and being around people and also like communicating and talking and figuring out how to frame things and make it beautiful. They get brought into corporate America. Yeah. And in corporate America, there are people that are like, I am a heads down, I'm going to work relentlessly hard, I'm just going to do my work to make my company grow and grow and grow. Now we need somebody that can communicate, what should we do? Well, let's hire some communications people. Who are most of the communications people? College party girls that come in and reflect their ideas about the way the world works and they bring ideas into corporations that are more about empathy and getting people to get along. And so this becomes the first, they just believe it themselves and then they start embedding it into the work and then it starts spreading out. And, and they're the ones that are the spokesperson and running the channels. So I believe that so much of what is going on in the Western world is dominated by college party girls. I'm dying laughing because that's the best thing I've ever heard. And I feel like I'm not a good guest right now because I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, you're making my Peter Thiel paradox. I know. Hard, yeah. <laughs> the problem is, is I agree. I completely agree. It's not a problem. Heck yes. And my number one, I love talking to students. That is like... I use social media as a tool. Like I've said, my number one value and my number one goal in life is to simply connect people. I'm a relationship person. Vance, I ruled the bars. I did not miss a day. And you know what? I could go and drink a glass of water and rule the bar. Like it wasn't the substance at the bar. It was the people at the bar. Yeah. And my number one advice I give to I talk to a lot of like new college students and then graduating college students. And I hire a lot of them, like I said. Go to the bars. Go socialize. It is the best thing you could do. And that is my – and um, my husband was the same way, which is hilarious because he is an introvert. But in that college setting, him and I went to the same college. He was a senior when I was a freshman. We did not cross over at – said bars because I did not go underage because I didn't have an older sister and I didn't have a good enough fake and I tried one time and I got kicked out so I never went back underage so we never met until after college but um we loved the same establishments but him and I the best connections we got out of college were 100% at those bars 
And I think that there's a whole bunch of engineers or people that are, you know, building things that they're like, what? Every moment I spent at the bar kept me from getting an A on my physics yes. test or, you know, the, the science lab or whatever that was. Yeah. And, but what do you think about my, like, this is what is driving culture. Because yes. like, I mean this on a very culture. deep level. Yeah. Yes, I 100% agree because every company I've come into and leave, like I've, I've been to um, three different companies and left them. And I would say if you went back to those people, it wasn't the work that they miss, it was the attitude that they miss and the culture and the connection and the excitement that you build at a company. And it's simply because I think it, this is another, it, you're a woo girl. What do you mean? So there's um, the five, like there's a strengths test that um, I can't even remember. Cubby does, I think. Um, And woo is one of those strengths. And I am a woo girl through and through. I was a cheerleader in high school. I was the, you know, like excitement in my sorority. I was, that's just who I am. And um, that's a phrase that I've heard multiple times is, oh, you're you're a woo girl. Like enthusiasm mm-hmm. or bringing like uh, yeah. attention to things that yeah. you're like, yeah. You're just like a pump up person. Like I want to pump you up because you pump me up and then it's going to pump the whole room up. And that's the kind of room I want to be in. Well, I, I didn't know how you would take this theory. I, I brought it up once on the podcast before, and it really angered some women that were not college party girls. And my whole point was, you're also not the person in a corporation yeah. that's like, why don't we do this new idea? Hey, yeah. everybody's into this thing. Why don't we try this? Hey, why don't we frame it this way? Yeah. And when you look at it over a long arc of 20 or 30 years of college party girls driving the communications departments of the major corporations, yeah. that means they are driving the conversation of the global world, really, yeah. nor- at least the Western world. And we need both. It's okay. We don't need everyone because I didn't like waiting in line at the college bars, right? Like, I don't want my whole college in the bars because I want to get into them. But also, um, my younger sister, I uh, will call her a grandma, right? Like, old soul Grandma, she is 22 years old. She's going to graduate this year. Practically a four point and a biology degree. Going to go to med school and she's getting married. She'll text when she goes to the bars because she wants us to be proud of her. (laughs) So we joke because there's four of us, right? The three, um, we were very social. Number four, not social at all. She could be a hermit. But we need her because she is like super smart and she's going to do something good in her company too but don't put her on the social committee she she's not going to do it yeah, don't I, put her on the comms department not her strength i think when i was younger and i re- made this realization i had a judgment about it and i was like this is not good this is bad but now i've just come to the realization of like this is just the way that it is and that people should understand that so much of culture is driven in this way that I think is kind of hidden if you've never worked in that environment. Well, and I guess sitting here, I could be like offended that you would call me a college party girl or. I thought you might be. So I was a little nervous. About really? It. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I don't get offended very much, especially. I don't know. You can, you can judge me. I don't care. Um, and the podcast listeners can judge me. But at the end of the day, like I wasn't unsafe. I didn't break any laws. Knock on wood. I've never been arrested. Well, and you are driving exactly to the beginning of the podcast, the the direction the that the company is yeah. going in. Like, what should we do? How yeah. should we present? Who are we trying to reach? How are we going to reach them? What is it? Yeah. And I think part of me, okay, maybe here's our paradox. Like part of me pushing and like my, my spark that I have and like pushing a little bit is like, I also hardly miss church on Sunday. And that was very important to me too. That goes back to anxiety, yoga, medicine, church on Sundays. Like, those are my three things to, like, keep me in my mindset. What kind of church? Um, I grew up Catholic. Okay. So that consistency and that tradition was very is very important to me. And I hardly missed. So some people who are very good Christians would probably look at me and think, well, that doesn't make, like, if you were at the bar Saturday night, that doesn't make you a good Christian. Well, I didn't break any laws. Like, I didn't break, do any sins, right? Like Yeah, I've always thought, like, <laughs> if Jesus was really worried about people drinking, his first miracle probably wouldn't have been to turn a bunch of water into wine, right? That's That's my thought. And, like, I just want to do what makes me happy. And I also want young people to know, like, 
you can do you and people might judge you and that's okay. Well, since you mentioned Catholicism, I'm going to bring up another like hypothesis. I had Go like a couple it. weeks off for the holidays. So <laughs> you're you're of, thinking. Uh, I love it. But I believe that there is a massive schism coming to the Catholic Church that will be a global schism, that, that it will actually break apart and we will have a Western church and an Eastern church. There'll be the Roman Catholic Church and probably the American Catholic Church. And uh, do you want to know why I think this? Yeah, tell me. So... I grew up in a in a Catholic church in a small farm town in central Illinois where my parents were one of the they, – they got together with a group of friends and they brought a Catholic church to this town. And it was of, of the like much more liberal mindset of like we're not talking about the crucifixion. We're talking about risen Jesus. We're not honoring the tabernacle. We are um, trying to include – women and allowing girls to be altar servers. So my parents were very much a part of this movement. They were post-Vatican II. And um, where I grew up in central Illinois is in the Peoria Diocese. And eventually uh, the bishop that was there left and a new one came in. And this one was a lot more conservative. So all of a sudden the risen Jesus that they had was taken down and they put a bloody crucifix up, right? Now all of a sudden there's iconoclastic statues of Mary and a place to do adoration, which in the liberal movement, this is not going on. And I've seen this build and build and build, particularly in places like the Peoria Diocese and Springfield Diocese. I went to Catholic church with my family for Christmas and the priest gave cer- celebrated the mass with his back to the parishioners, which really? is something that happened in the ni- pre-1960s. So like after Vatican II, they flipped it around and the priest spoke to the to the audience. But the but in the past, it was always, you are doing this with the Eucharist in front of him, and this is all towards Jesus. And so you can do it. It was never changing the rules saying you couldn't do it. It just was like, it just went away. Well, this priest who was like, I don't know, maybe late 20s, early 30s, I believe he is a part of a big movement going on in the Catholic Church, which is the only people still joining are going to become ultra-Orthodox. They're going to follow every single rule, and they're going to start slicing out the cafeteria Catholics, and that this is going to create a schism that Rome is not down with. The Pope right now is doing things like, we're going to potentially bless gay unions. He, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you saw that Notre Dame University, their sister school, St. Mary's, which is an all-girls school, mm-hmm. they tried to say, we're going to start letting trans women in. And people freaked out, but they were they were all set to do it. Yeah. So there is a movement going on where one side of the church is trying to liberalize and the other side is saying, no, no, no. In order to stay strong, we're going to become more orthodox. Yeah. And the schism is coming. So a few thoughts on that. You know that's actually happening right now in the Methodist faith. I didn't know that. The United Methodist Church has physically split into two. Okay. Um, and the reason I know that is because... I loved my Catholic upbringing. It was fantastic. It was um, a very positive space. I served on the altar. I got a card with 20 bucks in it when I graduated high school, thanking me for my time serving um, on the altar because I didn't think anything of it. Like that was just what you did. And I loved it. So I was very involved in the church. Um, Also small town, 500 people. There is... One Catholic church, two Casey's, and a casino. Okay. Right. And maybe a Methodist church, but I never knew anyone who went there. Okay. It was wonderful. Um, I also have some pretty big beliefs that don't align with what the Catholic faith is supposed to align with. But walking into that church, I have never felt like I was shamed or going to hell for thinking about that. And um, the priest, we're also 20 minutes from Iowa City, which Iowa City is known to be, it's where the University of Iowa is housed, and it's known to be a very liberal mindset. Um, So I don't know if that helped a little bit, but it just was always a very welcoming space. Um, Moving to St. Louis, I've really struggled with finding a church that I felt the same way at. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I always loved about the Catholic faith is that you could walk into a church and feel the same thing through all of the churches. And actually, as an adult right now, I'm not feeling that in this diocese. Um, and I've really, we, we've we actually not gone to a Catholic church here in St. Louis because it wasn't, it wasn't a good feeling. My husband is not Catholic. He was not raised Catholic. Uh, we were married in my Catholic church. Um, we did not do mass. 
we were married by the deacon that I grew up with, and it was the most beautiful ceremony I could have ever asked for, and he agrees. And his family, who also is not Catholic, and part of my family is not Catholic, um, it was the best ceremony we could have ever asked for. So walking in here, I have a big problem with n women not being able to be involved in mass. Like, that's not how I was raised. I never thought of anything differently. Um, so we've started going to a Methodist church in which we love. Very different. Um, but they all still do communion every Sunday. They still um, practice. It's actually very similar, just more better music because our music back home was terrible. <laughs> Not terrible, but it just like yeah, wasn't great. Yeah, 13 songs that you rotate throughout yeah, the yeah. year. Yeah, like yeah. there was no drums, no guitar. Like now there's drums and guitar. It's almost too good at this new church because I'm a bad singer. So I'm like, can we just sit down and like listen to the songs? I don't want to like stand up and sing every time. But it's wonderful, right? Like that's a good problem to have. Um, but they have recently said that actually based on gay rights, um, the United Methodist Church is splitting in two. And our pastor believes in something differently than another side, uh, another sector of the Methodist Church. So it's not just the Catholic Church. And uh, it's concerning to me because I believe our country is already really divided. And I think this is only going to make it worse and make it more extreme because by surrounding yourself with people that don't agree with you, you actually become more respectful and have a wider mindset. And like you and I can sit here, although on this podcast, we're not agreeing or we are not disagreeing on a lot of different things. We probably do in some aspects. And that's OK, because we're sitting here having the conversation. If I'm only surrounding myself by extremists in my values, I'm not getting other perspectives at all. So part of the church, but this isn't what organized religion stands for, is I think different opinions are OK. And letting one person decide what everyone's supposed to think is actually a really toxic way to think. Uh, but that's what organized religion is. I think orthodoxy is and, and liberalization are completely natural processes. And that if we were to go back and look in time and just speed time up, because information moves so much faster. So if we think of time as information, when people couldn't write, they couldn't share an idea from one place to another – information, therefore time moved very slowly. But now time moves very, very quickly, right? Because yep. information moves quickly. And I think that um, it is inevitable that there is always a group of people that are saying, let's be more open. And there's people that are saying, let's be more closed. And in particular, as the more open breaks most of the cultural norms of what's going on, then the people that are somewhere in the middle are like, do I want to go into the unknown right. or do I want to go to the known? And that's what the Catholic Church is going to try. The Orthodox Catholic Church is going to try and offer them is we will tell you who's in and who's out. We will tell you what the right rules are and what aren't. And for a lot of people that are afraid, this is going to be very, very comforting. This yeah. is going to be like, hey, we don't believe in um, women being men and going into locker rooms or something. Yeah. And so now you can be around a bunch of people that think that. And, you know, so again, this is one of those things where I don't have like a, I don't have a valence on it. I'm not yeah. like happy or sad about it. I just think like that's happening. And I think it's going to happen a lot faster than what people think. I also think based on tradition, like, what do you do? Like if and when we move to Southeast Iowa, which is our goal, based on like some of the thoughts of the Catholic church, like if I don't agree with it, but I want to go to church there because I enjoy the church. Am I following a path that I shouldn't be following? Or am I joining something that is tradition and comforting and ultimately I know is good people? I have this uh, argument with my in my mind all the time. So my wife uh, is a very sweet woman, goes to church every Sunday and takes our, our oldest daughter. The youngest one is like too loud or whatever, but that's coming soon. And like there are aspects of that that I'm really grateful for because I think that a lot of my grounding, a lot of the stories, the memes that are in my brain about what's the right way to behave and what's the right thing to do are there. But I also like, hey, there was a bunch of pedophilia that was coordinated or at least yes. like not stopped by the leadership. Are we all just going to pretend like that didn't happen? Like it's okay? So like the, that and like I could go into the nitty gritties of like the doctrinal differences, but like I don't feel like I can go there. And I certainly would really struggle to go 
and just sit there and be like, I'm supporting my wife and daughter by sitting here, but I don't believe it because what am I telling my daughter? Yeah. So like, but I want them to have those things. So I try and read them Bible stories of which I like struggle to believe are divine, but they're also very helpful. Yeah. When it's just you, it's one thing, but as you're finding out now. Bringing a human. Then you've got this whole nother layer of like, what do I... What do I believe, not just for me, but what do I believe for the future? Well, and I think this is another thing, and I think it gets into political parties and everything of like, I don't have to agree. And and actually, you know, we talk about how I was raised and and probably did a lot of adult things early, but it didn't seem like adult things. It was just really good lessons. But because of the conversations about... um, semen and and pulling animals and then also a lot of time spent in the truck i have a great relationship with my parents where we're very we're able to talk through things and also um not agree on things but still have a legit conversation and one of the things that my dad and i do not agree on is the catholic church right now because he lives where he grew up physically lives where he grew up um the church is where he grew up and it it is a very important place for me and his point is, well, if you, if you, okay, let me think how he says this. If you base your actions on not agreeing with all of the things, you will never find a place where you actually fit. That's very true. And I agree. Yeah. Um. Yes. Yes. Right. Like I, so I could find a different church in which we have here, but I still don't agree on all of the things. Um, I political As a Catholic, parties. doesn't it feel a little like going to Fisher Price? Like somebody, when you go to another service that is not Catholic, you're like, yeah, you guys are doing this, but not the real way. Like yes. The real way is this other way. Even if you're like, I don't, even if you're like me and you're like, I don't believe in that, that's not my yes. thing. I still go to another service and I'm like, yeah, well, that's kind of the I kind pretend, of like, that's a plastic way. I don't really know if we should have drum sets at church like i struggle with that (laughs) yeah it's great but it's not the catholic and and it's not what i'm used to Mm -hmm. um and i'm okay with taking that time and that piece in my head and taking that hour um actually we talked about naming pigs or like we talked about pigs and um a lot of our pig names came like amen alleluia like these were big <laughs> boars, right? That we sold a lot of semen on. And we it was literally a joke. Like my dad would name his animals at church every Sunday. And we never missed a Sunday because that man needed to go name some more animals. Um, but you do a lot of thinking. And, and faith is very important to me. And I think when it comes down to it, I want to raise a child that has its ability to make its own opinions but I think still exposing to other opinions is a really good way to form those opinions. Um, so I don't know what the answer on faith is, and I don't know what we're going to do. You think you'll do. get your child baptized? I want to, yes. And I want to simply because um, my world is a world of gray. I'm in marketing and communications. I can twist anything, right? Like I can, I can go down rabbit holes. My husband's world is very black and white. So if we think of things in the black and white sense – I really wish like religion and politics were stripped down a little bit and everyone kind of kept to themselves. Um, so like in my mind, there is like original sin and and to be baptized, like, yes, I would love that because that is very simple in my mind and, and that is okay. Um, and like, let's just- Original let's just sin, take, you're not going to fit in anywhere in these Protestants. I right? know. Like, you got no hope. I know. Like, yes, it, it, exactly. Right. And, <laughs> and just- um, like I'm just in in life right now. I think I'm just trying to think things very simple, yeah. <laughs> like black or white, because I could get myself spun up on on the grayness in life a lot. So you're in the midst of working with these companies and these brands. What's going on in ag that people that have got their heads down, either they're not in ag at all or they're yeah. just working hard. What's coming in this world that people don't expect? What's coming in this world? I think technology is here to stay. And what's coming in this world is a little bit frightening to me is we are in a place in life right now where uh, the American dollar is all over the board, right? Interest rates, uh, economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I am worried about, not worried about, 
in my family, I'm the sixth generation on both sides. So my mom comes from a century farm and my dad comes from a century farm. Very uncommon. My Century farms are those farms that have been in existence for over 100 years 100 in the years. same family. Correct. Yes. And, and not like the family moved and took a farm with them. Like the same piece of land has been in that family for 100 years. Uh-huh. So I've that on both sides. Um, I am so lucky to have both grandparents. They're um, all four are close to their 80s. Not all four are in their 80s. My grandma would tell me that that is not true. But they're close to their 80s. And um, th- passing that down is real. And passing that down and wanting for this baby to be the seventh generation is real in my mind. And again, that comes back to tradition. Uh, where it's a, the biggest challenge is how do you actually make that pencil out? Because land prices, um, a lot of land my grandpa bought for 1200 an acre to 1800 an acre, maybe $3,500 an acre, and we're looking at 12000 to $16,000 per acre. And that's today because by next month it could be more. Right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So for my husband and I to buy that piece of land – it will cost us over a million dollars and the margins in agriculture do not deliver that back. Um, we both work in the agriculture sector where we benefit from farmers every single day. <laughs> we are getting paid from that that farmer. Um, so we're taking advantage of the other side right now. Uh, but if we were to actually go home and farm, which we have the opportunity to do, um, the earning potential is a challenge. So learning how to make that happen, and there's no right answer. Um, But figuring out how to make that happen is really stressful right now. Yeah, I think that it's the only way out is through creativity because in the commodity game, you will always be driven to the most efficient, like the, the efficiency horizon where you're like, we, the the market will squeeze every single penny out of it so that the producer doesn't get it. That it's just like they can shave it down as much as they can. Yep. So that's why I interview people like Zach Smith, who does stock cropper, Jason Malk. I'm going to have a guy named John Kempf on. Are you okay. familiar with him? So he's an Amish guy that like does all this stuff on regenerative farming. Whoa. And my immediate reaction to regenerative farming is this is a communist plot to yeah. try and change farming. But I read his stuff and I don't think he's – It's like pretty cool. He doesn't seem like a commie to me. Okay. But I think that that's the only way through it. But what this is going to mean is there's going to be a narrowing – I think you've always had to be smart to be a farmer. Yep. Now it's going to be on a very, very different level. Like like there is going to be no more like we just worked harder than other people. It's going to be not just like we had to be more creative or we had to be smarter with our – you have to be – dramatically smarter and be yeah. able to dramatically try things that are radically different than what other people are doing in order to survive in this like world where the government is so devaluing our currency that yeah. only the biggest players will be able to own land. 100%. And at the end of the day, I've always said that um, farmers are actually Democrats who think they're Republicans because the amount of dollars that the U.S. government sense to farmers is wonderful. Um, so there's still like that, like crop insurance is government subsidized. Most farmers are borrowing money from a farm credit system, which is a bank, which is ran by the government. Not technically, but yes. Not the, ran. Okay, to, sorry. But the, the thing that the government does with that is yes. there are no depositors into the farm credit system. Yes. So the U.S. government plops money there and they say, give it out. Yep. And you just can't lose money. That's what you're not allowed okay, to do. Okay, not ran. Connected. Very deeply, deeply. Connected to to the government. Yeah, 100%. And that's 45% of all the lending done in all of farming is through farm credit. We're big farm credit. And I love them. They're great. Um, They're great humans, too. Like, they they know agriculture as well. Um, So it's super interesting of, like, how government systems are intertwined into the agriculture industry. But I don't want to advocate for that to change either because it's – how it's been and like good grief we've got to change enough on the farm in order to bring seventh generation and even like next generation back home home full time like I need everything else to stay the same so I can get my things in order so I can figure out how to do it and building my business um 
is going to help that. Like I can now work wherever I want to and being home on the farm is actually a huge benefit to me because I am ingrained in the day to day. Yet, does my business need to subsidize me keeping my land running? And I think that's the big question because that ultimately is kind of how it's going to have to be at this point. Speaking of your business, like now that people have gotten a chance to, to know you, like it, I actually typically don't like social media people for, for brands, but you and I have like really developed a, a good working relationship. Tell people about your business. What is it that you offer? Who hires you? Why do they hire you? Yep. So this spring I, I kicked off um, LMB Consulting. So what LMB Consulting does is we are a marketing consulting company for agriculture businesses specifically. Uh, We have a few different options. So I talked about that framework on social media. So I can introduce your company to that framework and I can implement it. I have a team underneath me that can help keep up the monthly management on that framework of what is social media. Get your company... uh, have a successful social media pages. So that is one aspect of my business. The other direction that I can go is you hiring me as a consultant specifically. So when I work with Pioneer Seeds, Pioneer Seeds specifically hires Lexi as a person and Lexi, myself, does the work for Pioneer Seeds. So there is implementation on that end. Um, The other side of the business that I have is speaking opportunities. So that's that's my heart, that's what I love to do, and it comes down to connecting with people. Um, So working on that aspect is Yeah, that's what we talk about a lot. What do you like to talk about? Yes, and you've been like amazing in that aspect because again, imposter syndrome, right? Like it's so nice to, to, Hear from another person who's doing it very successfully. What do you like to talk about? Great question, Vance. Like we've talked about this before. Uh, The two things that I am covering is uh, specifically talking to women and their imposter syndrome and how they can use that as a gift rather than as a, a deter. And then the other side of things is specifically using social media, but not in the way that you would think. Like we telling your story out the window. Let's talk about how to actually use social media to make relationships, not to go viral on social media because that's not the way that you're going to build a relationship. What do companies care about? Are you talking are you talking to companies at that point or are you talking to individuals at that point when you're speaking that way about relationships? Uh, relationships would be individuals. Individuals. Yep. Uh, so actually, a lot of my business right now, uh, where I want it to go, is more individual basis because that's what fills my cup up. Um, I love working for most of my clients are actually corporate co- clients, and that's that's my jam. Um, but I love that aspect because they bring a team of really talented individuals. So at the end of the day, the individual relationship is what I value. Uh, but corporate companies are putting together strong teams of individuals. So I do enjoy working with corporate companies as well. So you are going to have a child. Yeah. And uh, 20 years from now, that child will be, you know, a young adult. It's weird. What do you think the world will look like when they are an adult? I'm a hopeful person. I am a dreamer, right? So I think a lot of people would say, oh, the world's going to hell. And maybe it is, but I don't want to believe that. I truly think that we will see in the next 20 years a a lot of resolutions or spinoffs like we've talked about in church and politics. I think there's going to be a revolution of change because I think people of my age and my generation are tired of trying to be put into buckets that they actually don't fit in in either bucket. Uh, so I think there will be some revolution. Meaning like I was presented, I can either be a Republican or a Democrat, but I'm not either of those. Or I can be conservative or liberal, but the, yeah. the world is much more I can nuanced. be Catholic or Protestant. Okay. I can be rural or urban. I could be corporate or entrepreneurial. And it'll be some sort of a hybrid mixture. In the I think so. I think we're ready for that. Um, that's what I want to see. I feel like that's where I live is right in the middle of a lot of things. And I really hope that then the more people I talk to, the more people are right in the middle. There's just nothing that represents them. Do you have a sense if uh, I know you're not finding out whether it's a boy or a girl, but do you have a sense for which one's life would be easier? Mm. Okay, well, I think it's a girl. So tune like 
stay tuned. You intuitively think I it's I intuitively gonna be- think it's a girl for quite a few reasons. Um, life easier. Typically, I would say a male's life would be easier, but I actually think it's the decade of the woman. I think with the Barbie movie, <laughs> um, I think with, and, and I come from that perspective, um, not because I ever feel like, I mean, there's always comments from men, right? But some of my greatest advocates and greatest friendships and greatest learnings have come from men. And it's from me being able to either ask what I need for or being able to take those learnings and put them into action. And I think females will continue to be able to do that and men will be able to lift them up um, and work together to whereas I'm actually really excited for the future of our young women. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And and this is a whole nother aspect that um, I think as we get into leadership, a lot of our leadership and our Fortune 500 companies. Um, right now, there's 11% of those Fortune 500 companies are led by women. And I don't think it's because women aren't talented enough. I think it's just because of the age and the experience that our women in leadership have. We haven't gotten to that point yet where uh, we're getting we're getting more women in leadership because it wasn't normal. There's also something like biological about that too. Like my wife is smarter than me, is hard, more hardworking, is like just more capable. But once the two girls came along, like her interest in in succeeding in that domain, like she wants her business to succeed, but she could care less about being in charge. Like she wants us to be financially stable yeah. and raise the children. And so yeah. there's a bunch of that that I think in popular culture we don't talk about very much, but yeah. like I've watched my wife go from being like on the executive track at – advanced weapon manufacturing companies and her being like this I, I don't good. want that at all yeah I actually feel that and I've felt that I mean over the past 20 weeks right and it's it's weird I don't I can't speak to it because it's a radical yet. shift in in the way you were to holy you cow yeah. and like even talking to my husband who is like my biggest cheerleader and vice versa for him too right like we are um together and there's been a client that I travel for that I actually had to let them know that I'm not going to travel for them anymore. Therefore, I don't think I can do the job well. Therefore, I can't be their person anymore. And it broke my heart to do that. And <laughs> he, he very kindly said, did you not think this would happen? I was like, no. No, I was going to strap that kid on my back or you were going to stay home with it. And I was going to go. And guess what? I don't want to do that anymore. And I've not even met the child yet. <laughs> like we're due the end of May. Um, we have some time. But right away, I got that that instinctual, instinctual feeling that was like, I need to listen to this. Now, I still think I can accomplish my goals and be the person I want to be and use that as a skill or as a as a gift or as a something to lean into, but I don't want to be the road warrior that I was um, because I want to spend Christmas with my family for not the day of Christmas, but the week of Christmas. And I want to be at, goodness, I hope we don't have any athletic children, but we will, I hope we do too. But like, I don't want to be a baseball ball mom, but I will be a yeah, baseball mom. Yeah, as you say, you mom. would be a baseball mom, yeah. <laughs> My husband played a lot of baseball and I um, did not. And that was like baseball were summers in Iowa, which is super interesting. Um, So that was my pig walking time. Um, So I really didn't go to a lot of baseball games growing up and I'll be a baseball mom. Well, Lexi, this has been a great conversation. If people wanted to find you, obviously it's not on Twitter, um, but where where <laughs> where should people go to find you? Yeah, so my handle on Twitter and w- we can connect on Twitter. I'll, I'll I'll join the platform again. But Twitter and Instagram is Lexi Merrick Beeler all together. Um, my business website is lmb consulting dot co. I'm dot co, not dot com. Um, and I also have a blog, lovelexi.co. 
Uh, so that is targeted for young women. And then the business is the business side of things and social media is all encompassing. So I, I like to be all over the place. I would love to connect. Like I've said, I'm a relationship person. So Well, I am certain that some of the listeners will, uh, will reach out to you. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. It's fun to record this. You and I talk like, like this, this all, the time, all yeah. the time. So yeah, this was wonderful.